say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Maters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn, kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. Chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in Farmer's Kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate right here in Farmer's Kitchen. In town, Farmer's Country Kitchen. cook something good now. Hello and welcome to Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. Well, hello, Mrs. Farmer. How are you? You're looking awful cute today. Oh, uh, you look pretty cute yourself. Pretty cute. <laughs> I mean, super duper cute. I like that. You know what? We've got all kinds of stuff going on today. You know, after Easter, you got a bunch right. of boiled eggs. Mm -hmm. And most people, I guess, do something with them. Egg salad or... But I had an idea the other day when we were making our fish dip. That was good. Mm -hmm. was I had an good. idea to try to make things a little bit better for us because we're trying to lose that little time, or I am trying to lose that little bit the winter. of winter Me too. weight that I got on. Because have you noticed that in winter time you crave carbs? Mm -hmm. You know, spring's coming. Right. We're going to start to get outside and work a lot more. In fact, we're going to do some fence moving today to let the sheep out, Right. to let them start to access some of that green stuff that's out right. there. I was taking a look at them a little while ago and I found a snake. Now, hey. I know how you feel about snakes. I don't like snakes. In fact, let's take a look at how you think about snakes. Obviously, you have the same reaction as a lot of people I have don't to like snakes. snakes. They won't hurt you for the most part. I don't care. In central Kentucky, in this part of the state right here, we're, we're pretty good. There are cotton mouths in the way western part of the state. Remember the time we were jug fishing? Yes. We found one. And there are copperheads in the outlying areas of Kentucky. So I said get rid of all snakes. But I found a little garter snake, and we're going to tell real quick how to look at a snake just at, a, just at a glance and say, okay, this is probably not poison. So when you got him up in your face looking at him, yeah, right. you'll know. Yeah. Here's one way to find out. All right, now that we're IDing species, I found my first snake today. Now, this is a garter snake. Poor guys. I've seen people say, hey, is this a baby this, that, or the other with their little heads chopped off? These don't hurt anything. They eat insects, small mice, whatever they can catch. They have round pupils, the most common sign of a snake that's not poisonous is a round pupil in the United States. He doesn't have pits, he's just got little nostrils, and he sticks his little tongue out as a sensor to smell the air, basically, is what he's doing. And this, again, is a common garter snake. They have little yellow stripes down their back, they're kind of grayish colored. Now, he's dirty, he's been under the ground. He's just minding his own business, going about doing his thing. They will bite you if you aggravate them. They can't hurt you. Now, you want to wash off your little wound because they have little mini, mini, mini teeth so they can swallow their prey. They're small, tiny teeth. But you might get an infection or something from them if you don't wash it out. I've been bitten many times by these. But he's not interested in eating dandelions. He's interested in going about his way and me leaving him alone. So I'm going to lay him down. One thing about them that they will do, if you catch them, they'll rub under their tail. They have a really gray, stinky fluid that comes out. So if you're handling them and you smell something like that, it's pretty nasty. That's just one of their defense mechanisms. But he's going to be fine. See ya. So that's generally the first snake you're going to see. Uh-huh, and the last, I hope. No, it won't be the last. When it starts to warm up, they start coming out of their little cracks and uh -huh. crevices. And I'm, I'm, there he was, I'm no, armed. Don't hurt. Don't, don't. Now, we got one black snake that lives out here. Mm -hmm. And I see her every so often. I call her Lucy. After, I better not see after her. After the one that used to be in Salado Center. Over there. Okay. But you know what? We have a visitor coming by. Mm -hmm. He's going to share a venison recipe. Now, a yeah. lot of people have their freezer full of venison because in the fall, we take our venison. Mm -hmm. Now, I am an avid deer hunter. And I have taken many, many deer over the year with a bow. Last week I showed you, because we have the questions all the time, what did you do to your arm? How do you shoot a bow? Right. How do you do this? How do you do that? What's wrong with your arm? Well, here's how we take venison. We had a 
had uh, a couple young fellows come in and hang out for a little bit. Not what we were looking for, obviously. Then a little bit later, I heard a noise behind me and turned around and looked, and here comes a doe. And just like that, she was on us. I'm probably not your average deer hunter. A lot of folks are after the big bucks. Right. And nothing aggravates me more to each his own. But somebody say, well, I shot this buck. Now I got to find somebody to give the meat to. I That's got a crazy. problem with that. Yeah. I am very sorry. A big buck deer, if processed properly, can taste just as good as a doe. Right. Well, maybe not as good. I prefer to Pretty take cool. does. Yeah. And we did a processing video. I thought if we're going to take deer, good organic meat, fresh out of the woods, which we do right. all the time, we ought to show how to process it. Now, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we did this thing years ago. It's the most comprehensive way to take every bit of meat. And here I am with Sim Harp. If you want to look that up when you're taking your deer, we've got plenty of venison. Now, let's get started. Our ducks are laying. Beautiful eggs. Our ducks are laying beautiful eggs. Now, we peeled them in a hurry, and we're not worried about things being real pretty here. But here, Left here's... One. Here's, duck eggs have a little bit of color. Now that's not duck doo doo per se. They have a little bit of color. Now they're a little bit longer, a little bit, a little bit more They're whiter than our other ones. And they are delicious. Their yolk is bigger. Mm -hmm. You love them. In contrast to the white, and it's really rich and it's tasty and it's really good for baking. Yeah. I eat a lot of duck eggs. Yes, you do. So what are we going to do with these eggs? I started thinking about our little fish dip and our substitute for mayonnaise. Yes, being healthy. Avocado. So what we're going to do, Mrs. Farmer, in fact, you can coach us through this. You're going to take your avocado. There we go. Now that's a beautiful avocado. Yes, it is. Take that out. And we've only got a few eggs, so let's just, let's just pop one out. You do it according to how many eggs you have. But there's so many Easter eggs floating around right now sitting that's in your right. refrigerator. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to take our eggs, and you'll go ahead and cut those and take the yellows out. We're going to mix the yellows up with the avocado. So along with this, to season it, I'm going to put a little bit of cumin in here. Yeah. We got some bourbon smoked paprika. Are you kidding me? And this is from Bourbon Barrel Foods in Louisville. A little salt, a little pepper. So you're making deviled avocado duck eggs. Yes. I like how about it. That? I like it. And I'm going to wait till you see how I plate those up in a minute. It's going to be really right. pretty. And we've been throwing, I'm sorry, I love grandma's pickles. We just got to put a little bit of, chop some of those up. Let's I put some about, big pieces of pepper in here. I got about seven of her pickles. Does that work? Yeah, that's probably too much, but we'll take a little bit out. Put a little cumin in there. Now look at that. Yeah. Oh my, are you kidding me? Okay, now while she's mixing these eggs up, I'm going to go find a beautiful garnish, an edible beautiful garnish to put on the side. So some people might say, why in the world would you bring a noxious weed to put amongst your beautiful eggs? That's our salad. That's right. Dandelions. Okay, do you know how many unpleasant hours I spent in my parents' yard with this little tool mm -hmm. that had a like a forked right. end and it was made to go in the ground and pop out a the root of a dandelion? They do mess up a yard. They don't mess up a you yard. You should have been out there eating it, like on your hands and knees. Our yard right now, <laughs> if it wasn't for dandelions and broadleaf plantain, it would be brown. Now, so what happens when you grab an egg, which we will, here you go, Mrs. Farmer. Thank you. I'm going to include one piece of salad. That is dandelion out of the yard. Okay. I picked an area 
where I'm pretty sure. Nobody went potty? Nobody went potty. No <laughs> dogs or cats or anything like that. So I can eat it? You sure? Remember when we did our salad out mm -hmm. of the yard and it was delicious? Mm -hmm. There you go. Do you know every part of the dandelion can be utilized? Vitamins A, B, C, K, magnesium, potassium, iron, zinc. It's good for you. It's delicious. You know what else you can eat? Take a bite of that. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's good for you. It's not bad, actually. The roots of a dandelion are good for you. Some people use them as a, as a coffee substitute. So I'm going to take me an egg. Oh, they're pretty. With the beautiful flower. You're supposed to eat it slowly. Mm -mm. That's delicious. That was delicious. Good snack, good mm -hmm. healthy snack. I like how it looks too. It's cute. And every bit of it's edible. Mm -hmm. Again, dandelions, healthy. They say it's kind of a good cleansing agent for your liver. So you're trying to tell me get in the yard and eat them up? Yes. Okay. Now, broadleaf plantain. Let's take a look at that real quick. 100,000%. If you get a sting, a bee sting, right. wasp, take you some of that and you mash that up, put it directly as quick as you can on that sting. Because you've done this before. And hold it right mm -hmm. up against it. Done. Yeah, so it works. promise you, as wet as it's been, it's probably a good time to take a look at your sheep or goat's hooves to make sure mm -hmm. they don't have any hoof rot. Now that's very common and probably right. they have some degree of that to make sure they don't have that. So you need to clean those, scrape yeah. those, clip those, and get that out because this time of year is very common. Yeah. Speaking of that, let's move them into another field and let them get some green grass. I have a lot of questions here lately about how do you clean your cast iron. It's very simple. How do you clean, season your cast iron? Say you're done. Say you've cooked eggs that morning, eggs and bacon on your cast iron skillet. And it's, it's set for a while. So what do you want to do to get it reseasoned? Basically get it over a hot fire. Have you some water, hot water, not necessarily boiling, but you don't want to take cold water and put on a hot skillet or you can crack that skillet and that's bad. You don't want that. Pour you a little bit of water in there. I like a flat wooden spoon, take and move everything to the side, wipe it out with a rag, take you some more water if you have to, come back with your sponge, get everything off that you can. Once you've gotten everything out of there, wipe the pan down, then bring in your olive oil, put it all over that pan, set it aside, you're good to go. Fire's going. Tim Sloan's here. We've known each other for 150 years. That's been a while since the 80s, early he, 80s. He, wow, that's going back. You know, the thing is, my friends are typically people you grow up with in school or whatever. We grew up together at Fish and Wildlife. That's right. And it's it's a cool thing that my friends are not only interested in Fish and Wildlife, but naturalists, biologists, so on and so forth. We're going to talk about birds later, but first, Normally we would do this with venison or some kind of wild game that's in your freezer. Yeah, that's this a very good recipe for venison. First of all, I want to know how it got its name, Flying. Okay, this is, this is uh, we call it Tom's Flying Meatloaf. <laughs> flying and, Meatloaf. And my good friend Tom, he cooks for a, a master guide in Alaska. Every fall, Tom's in Alaska uh, cooking you so know, for this outfitter. So that's he sneaks in up there. <clears throat> yeah, so he spends, his, he spends his falls in Alaska and... Uh, the guys out in the spike camps, you know, they're eating freeze-dried food. Well, after they've been out for two or three days, Tom, they fly over the guys and he drops them little tiny little meatloafs that he prepares and, and just, you know, drops it out of the plane. They fly real low and slow. And he said, those guys devour it on the spot. And so, so whatever they bring in, elk, moose. It's usually, it's usually caribou or moose, um, whatever game they've brought in. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's doll sheep. Um, so he's, he's making meatloaf out of that. He makes meatloaf out of it. Now you brought some pretty interesting ingredients and, and we're going to start doing more of our wild game recipes because we got it in the freezer and we're going to use it for people interested in, in that sort of thing. If I was doing venison and you too, you'd probably put a little hamburger in there for the fat content yep. so it wouldn't dry out. Yep. Tom's flying meatloaf. Tom's flying meatloaf. Let's do it. All right. So I'm going to saute my vegetables. I'm uh, one medium sized onion diced, two carrots diced up and one stalk of celery. And we'll just cook these till they get, you know, soft. 
So while the uh, while the carrots and the onions are, are cooking down, I'll go ahead and add this this uh, two cups of corn chips. They hold the meatloaf together, make it into a loaf. Gonna add an egg, one egg, a quarter cup of milk. I'm gonna add a can of chilies. It's a Southwest, Southwestern meatloaf. And I'm gonna add a teaspoon of butter. And then my spices. It's a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of chili powder, a teaspoon of pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of cumin. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up a little. All right, those look like they've softened up. Scrape them in here. I'm gonna brown the meat for just a minute. So you're actually browning your meat before you put before you put. In. I like to brown the meat first. Um, for one thing, it gets it, with wild game. It's not a problem, but if you're using burger, it it gets rid of the grease. But also, I think it just tastes better. It just tastes better if you brown it a little bit. All right. The last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna throw in a little cilantro. All right. So you just mix it up, and then we're gonna put it in our meatloaf pan, which. You want to grease just a little bit. And we talked earlier about our Dutch oven being an oven. We are preheating that oven. You know, if we put it in there in a cold Dutch oven, well, it's not cooking. Yeah, that's right. So when we open the top on that thing, it's going to be hot, and then we can time it from there. So this is, you're talking about 40 minutes here, so. That's right, 40 minutes, 350 degrees. Okay, just going to put this in my meatloaf pan. You want it fairly, fairly well stuffed. I gotta we, tell you, that smells really good. We use just about the right amount. That smells really good. I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll pull the top off over here and you set her down in there. What? So what I'm you dropping think? it. Perfect. We're cooking. Now yeah, we're cooking. Now what I'm gonna do, because that's been sitting there a while, is I'm gonna put a little bit more heat on the top and the bottom. All right, now we're gonna stack. For those who haven't stacked, it's a very simple thing. You take a 10 inch, put it on top of 12 inch. You can put a 12 inch on top of 12 inch. So you try to time these things so they come out about the same time. So you got a bourbon glazed carrot? Well, as you can tell from the meatloaf, I really like carrots. I like root vegetables. A couple tablespoons of olive oil, a couple tablespoons of butter, um, three tablespoons of honey, and then bourbon. I'm just gonna kinda mix it around in there, right? And I'm gonna add uh, a little sea salt and a little pepper, and that's all there is to it. Oh yeah. This smells great. Pour a little bit of it on there, and then I'm gonna reserve just a little bit of it to add it later. Sounds like a plan. A lot of people, I was surprised at the people who know their birds, and some, you know, there's a lot of names that people you know, like we heard people call fish uh, pumpkin seed, which they weren't. Sure. They? People just assign names. They'll call a blue jay a bluebird. Exactly. Because it's blue. Exactly. So I got a simple feeder, probably the cheapest feeder you can find on the market. You can have a whole lot of fun looking at your window at a simple feeder. And as we go along, almost immediately, this little guy showed up. This little gray, just a very slate colored, speaking of slate, it's kind of gray. Yeah. It's got a white one. So they used to call them slate colored juncos. Right. Now they call them northern juncos, I think. They, they changed the name a little bit, but it's a junco. They, they're snowbirds. People call them snowbirds. Very common this time of year. They show they? up in the winter, they leave. This next guy was kind of obnoxious. He came in almost immediately and started running everybody else off. So that is a... It's a red-bellied woodpecker. Despite the fact that it's got red on the head, it's a red-bellied woodpecker. A red-headed woodpecker looks quite a bit different, but that's a, that's a male red belly woodpecker, I believe. And we're only going to identify what we see at my particular feeder and, and things that we see on the ground. Now, we may see a red-headed woodpecker, but it looks nothing like this. No. He's probably going to be on a periphery right. flying around. But that's a red bellied woodpecker. Doesn't have a complete red head. He's got it, the male has it all the way from the beak back. The female has it from about here back. This... It's hard to say the name, but it's, it's a cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> UK fan, obviously. Yeah. Very, very common. That's but a male in his, a, that's right. in all his glory. <laughs> Northern Cardinal, yep. And then shortly he showed up with her. There's a female. And then we see. That's a titmouse. The titmouse, which we'll show a better picture of and, here in a second. And it's like you said, titmice uh, earlier, Mark, and you see it go to the feeder and they carry off a seed and fly to a tree and then they crack they'll, it open and eat it. Yeah. They'll pop yeah, their little Because they can't, they can't eat the whole seed. They're, uh, and their call sounds like uh, it's one of the distinct ones. It's Peter, 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 Peter. Here's a kind of a front view of one. 
Cat. Uh -huh. Oh, and there's a new one. So that is, I believe, a chipping sparrow. It's got that Rufus colored head. It's got then it's got the white line, and then it doesn't show up real well. But they have a black line through the through the eye. And they're common, you know, in your yard. Tiny little birds. That's a red winged blackbird with the like you said the stripe on its wing. Mm -hmm. Quite noisy this time of year, and I really I like red winged. They make birds. a beautiful <laughs> warbling kind of call. Yeah. There's pair of doves. Some, there's another pair of doves. I always like to see doves. But the doves this time of year, they do a lot of cooing, following each other around, and lovey-dovey, they call yeah. it. That's where that expression comes from, <laughs> doves all. Now we have a villain coming on the scene. This guy does some mean things. So that's a brown-headed cowbird, and they're, uh, they used to just be out west, but they've, they've, as we've opened up the forest, they've, they've moved east, and uh, so they'll lay their eggs in another bird's nest, and the other bird will hatch the eggs and raise it. Sometimes you'll see like a, a, a sparrow with this big cowbird following it, and they're, they're trying to feed it. And uh, they adapted that because I think they used to follow the buffalo herds. So they followed herds of big animals, they'd lay their eggs and they'd move on. Okay, and I'm gonna call this the duh bird. Surely everybody knows what this is. Well, if they don't, it's a robin. Right. Yeah, and they uh, occur in huge flocks. And here's our surprise oh, guest. This that's, is, this is, that's a good one. This is a little something different. Yeah, that's a that's a brown thrasher, and it's a member of the thrush family. And like a mockingbird, it does lots of different calls. And I believe brown thrashers, they repeat their calls twice. So mockingbirds do four times or more. Brown thrashers, they'll repeat it twice, and they move on to the next call. So if they're doing a cardinal call, they'll do it twice, then they'll do a titmouse call. They're, they're really neat. One of my favorite birds, and they like brushy hedgerows. And, mm -hmm, and that's where he around was. Your, around your pool is the exactly the kind of habitat they'd like. And that's it for the birds. Well, we better go check out the food. All right. All right. Got to put the sauce on here, which is really salsa and ketchup and brown sugar, and a little bit of mustard. I think we're ready. It's a very veggie meatloaf. That's just absolutely delicious. And you know, it's got a little carbs going for it, because those guys out there, you know, they're climbing mountains. And oh, yeah. Carrying packs around. Ooh, that's good. If it had more heat in it, it would almost taste like a tamale. Because you got that, you got a little bit of that that chip flavor going on in there. It's, mm. very, it's a very southwestern take on meatloaf. You know what? Look how those carrots came out. I like that little bit of brown where they're sitting on the bottom. Didn't get too hot, but it cooked them perfectly. I think it's the bourbon. <laughs> mm. That Woodford is uh, excellent for cooking. I think you can use it for other things, but it's good for cooking. So we've got all these recipes from all kinds of different places, and sometimes I forget an ingredient or two because I don't measure. So if you decided to go on there and look something up, where would you go? Well, I go to TimFarmersCountryKitchen.com. Do you really? Com. I really do. <laughs> I really do. And what do you do? You click I look on up YouTube? recipes and I, uh, yeah, I watch it on my, I have my iPad in the kitchen. So I'm looking and because you can just, you can back it up and play it again if you didn't get it. And it's quite useful. You know, and you probably already are, but if you weren't on our Facebook page, what would you do? I'd friend you on Facebook. Just click like. Click and like. you're good to go. We have a lot of great Facebook friends out there. Thank you so much for coming out Thank and cooking you. with us. Thank you. Looking at birds, all kinds of fun stuff. Cowboy we'll meatloaf. See you next week in a brand new Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. To order a cookbook, please call 502-319-0487 or email timfarmerck at gmail.com.